All right, this experimental and theoretical probability stuff is, it's going to seem far more difficult than it actually is, okay? Because the only difference between theoretical and experimental probability is that one is the probability of something happening before you actually do it, that's theoretical, and one is the probability based on what you did. So, again, it says right here what actually occurs. So that is experimental probability. So let's look at some examples here, okay? All right, so this may be a better way for you to remember this. Experimental probability is the probability from what was done. So it's based on something that has already happened. Theoretical probability is probability based on what will be done. Okay, so again, let's, let's look at an example. So if I take a spinner, right? So let's say that I've got a spinner. It's got four sections on it. And we have them colored like this. Uh, then theoretically, we could say, for example, that the probability of getting red would be what? Again, nothing's been done yet, right? All we're doing is looking at what, what will happen if we were to spin this many times or even one time. What would the chances be that you spin red? Well, you can see there's four different choices, and one of them is red. So it'd be one-fourth chance of spinning red. Okay, so again, that's it's based on what happens, what you expect to happen, okay? So if we were to spin on this thing, all right, so if there was a spinner and we were to flick that spinner and it were to turn, we would expect it to land on red uh, one-fourth of the time or 25% of the time, or in other words, there's a 25% chance of it landing on red, okay? Now, uh... On the other hand, let's say that we were to take this spinner and we were to spin it many, many times. How many times? Let's say we were to spin it. Usually people use a pretty nice even number, like a thousand times. And let's say, so we spin it a thousand times. And we look back at our data and we see... Oh, how many times did it land on red? Well, maybe it landed on red uh, 956 times. Okay. All right, so you can see it landed on red 956 times out of 1,000 spins. So what are the chances based on the experiment? Okay, so this is experimental because we actually did spin it 1,000 times. Okay, how many times did it land on red actually? Uh, you can reduce this, but uh, right now all we're really looking for is to get the idea of the difference between theoretical and experimental. And again, since we spun it, since it actually did happen that we spun this thing 1,000 times, this would be considered experimental probability. Let's look at one more example here, and we'll consider maybe... A six-sided fair number cube. All right, so it'll have, uh, sometimes they use dots, right? So you'll see dots like this. Maybe uh, something like this. I don't know. Okay, and it would say, what is the chances that you would roll? So the chances that you would roll a uh, four on this number cube. Well, theoretically, okay, so again, we haven't rolled it, we just looked at it. Theoretically, we would expect it, okay, there's six different sides. How many of those sides have four? One of them does, okay. So again, this would be considered theoretical. Why is it theoretical? Because we haven't actually done anything with the dice other than looked at it, okay. So we found that six of the, there are six sides and only one of them had a four.
all right? Maybe it's a different kind of dice where it has two sides that are four, okay? In that case, well, instead of a one there, you'd have a two, and uh, that's the only difference, okay? Theoretically, that would be the difference. But what about experimentally? Well, experimentally, the probability of four is... Well, we, we don't know, because we don't know how many times we've rolled the dice, or how many times it was ever rolled. We don't know what's happened. Uh, but let's say that some kind of experiment took place where they rolled the dice 500 times, okay? And how many times would it have landed on four? Well, we'd have to go back to maybe a paper or something like that, where we've kept track of how many times we've rolled and what number came up when we rolled, all right? And we would look back, and maybe it landed on four, I don't know, uh, 115 times, okay? Well, again, this is experimental because we would have rolled the dice, we would have actually rolled the dice 500 times. And we would have seen, based on the data that we took, that it rolled four 115 times okay now usually they're going to ask you to compare these two all right and you'll say well 2 6 is 1 third and 115 over 500 is less than that so I came out much less than what we would have expected okay because theoretical is what we expect to happen All right, so theoretical is what we expect to happen. Experiment, experimental is what actually happens. All right, here's, an, here's, an, here's an example, and if we look at this, it tells us the spinner has three equal sections, and it is actually spun 60 times. So would this be experimental or theoretical? Well... Because it actually was spun 60 times, we would know that this is experimental probability, which is what you see down here. All right? It's experimental because it actually was spun. So on number two, it's saying, well, uh, what is the theoretical probability? And you can see in the last uh, problem that it was split into three equal sections. And we have the probability of red... You have the probability of blue, and then you have the probability of green, all right? And, for example, the probability of red would have been one of the three sections. Bam. And as it turns out, all of these are going to be one-third. So, uh, again, in comparison, one-third, and if we look back at the example, it landed on red... Uh, 24 out of the 60 times, which you can see they've reduced over here. Um, it gave us two-fifths, okay? And it's almost one-third, okay? Uh, you could say, yeah, two-fifths is very close to one-third. On the other hand, you could also say, when comparing two-fifths and one-third, well, one-third is bigger than two-fifths, and be done. Okay, and some teachers are going to make you write this as a sentence. Okay? Two-fifths is uh, less than one-third. One-third is bigger than two-fifths, uh, but they're very close. Something to that effect. All right, let's look at D here, all right? Two coins are tossed ten times. Both coins land on heads six times. Compare the experimental probability to the theoretical probability. If they're not closed, explain why they would be different. Okay, so two coins are tossed ten times. So how many times did we toss these coins? Twenty total times. Now that each, both coins land on heads six times. So let's look at 
the probability of heads. Now, is this an experimental probability, or is this a theoretical probability? Well, since this is based on something that actually has happened, right, because they've been tossed, this would be experimental, all right? So how many times did they land on heads? Well, six for the one coin, six for the other would give us 12 times, all right? And this would simplify down into, uh, what well, would divide both these by four, right? That would give us three-fifths. And if we look at the theoretical probability of heads, we would have two different sides and one heads. Okay, and that's for both coins. So some of you may have been thinking two out of four, and that's fine because it's the same thing, right? <clears throat> so since this is the case, we need to compare these two numbers. We've got one-half and three-fifths. Uh, and we could say again, one half is less than three fifths, or you could say that three fifths is a little bit bigger than one half. It's ten percent bigger. Some people would say that's a big discrepancy, but uh, it's actually not too bad. It just depends on how you look at it. All right. All right. For E, we've got three coins. They are tossed, so this is ex experimental, ten times. So how many times did we actually toss these coins? 30. Three coins land on heads once. So we're looking at the probability of heads. And one of the coins landed on heads. Two and three coins landed on heads once each. So that's three out of 30. Well, this would simplify down into one-tenth. Okay. Theoretically, however, the probability of heads would have been, okay, again, how many, how many sides are there? Well, let's consider all three coins. So uh, each coin has two sides. You got a heads and a tails. Two sides for each coin. There's three coins. That would give us three, uh, six rather, six total sides. And how many of those sides are heads? Well, each of the three coins has a head, so it's three out of six, which is one half. Now this one, there is a huge difference between these two. You've got one tenth and one half. Uh, so what would be a possible reason for the discrepancy? Well, maybe again, there's not enough trials here. Uh, perhaps there is a slope in the surface that you're tossing on. Maybe you're only tossing it straight up or you're not tossing it high enough. Maybe it's weighted so that it falls on tails more often. But uh, yeah, there are many different reasons why there could be a difference. All right, so theoretical and experimental probability, yes, we can use both of them to predict what will happen, all right? Theoretically, we usually use this in order to find out what will happen, right? Uh, and if we were to do a certain activity uh, until we do it an infinite number of times, uh, then the theoretical and the experimental probability would always be the same. However, keeping uh, doing something for an infinite number of times is not ideal, right? Uh, in any case, usually the more we do something, the more close we get to what would be the theoretical probability. So whenever there is a difference in experimental probability, we can expect a change to happen until it gets closer to theoretical. Again, it's all predicted. It doesn't mean it will actually happen. So when we make these predictions, that makes this theoretical. Now notice in this example, since uh, this is based on theoretical probability, 
Uh, what we're going to do is first look at, uh, and do, don't worry about what the book has, okay? Because we're just going to get rid of this, all right? Let's get rid of this and do this problem by ourselves, okay? Because it's, it turns out it's very easy. Uh, the media buyer is expecting to sell 5,000 DVDs, all right? And it wants to know uh, how many comedies we would expect to buy, so... Uh, notice there was 580 comedies. So we're going to set up a proportion, which we've done already. And remember, the part is going to go here. Okay, now that's usually for percentages, but these are equal uh, fractions, okay? And there's no percentages here. So let's look. Uh, there's 580 comedies. If we were to add all these numbers together, we would find that there were 2,000. DVDs. Okay, now the 2,000, this is a total. So since that's the case, we need the total here as well. Okay, because they should correspond. If the total's on the bottom, then it should be on the bottom. If it's on top, it's on top. Because there are eight different ways to set up a proportion, all right? So we look back and we see... Uh, if a media buyer wants expects to sell 5,000 total DVDs this year. So this is where the 5,000 goes. And what we want to know is how many comedy, right? Because it was 580 comedy. So that's on top of the fraction. So it should be on top of this fraction as well. How many comedies <clears throat> will sell if there's 5,000 total DVDs? And from here, you're just going to use the fishy method order to solve. So you start with X, you're going to go down in this case, and across, come back around, and up, and that's what you got. So you got the 5,000 times 580 divided by the 2,000, and that's going to be your answer here. And it looks like we end up with 1450 comedy DVDs, and that's our answer. Okay, so when you're finding, uh, when you're essentially predicting how many DVDs, in this case, you would have sold with 5,000 DVDs, uh, yeah, you can set up a proportion like this because it should be proportional, all right? 